Hi, I'm Dr. Sridhar Kalyana Sundaram, and uh, today we have an expert session on pediatric asthma. We have with us Dr. David Kramonasini, who is a consultant pediatrician uh, from UK and uh, qualified in Oxford and uh, many uh, years of experience in this field. He has special interest in allergy and asthma. We were colleagues before at American Hospital for a few years and now we work at different places. So he's at Mediclinic Parkview Hospital. And uh, uh, thank you, David, for coming over and sparing the time. Thank you, Dr. Frida. Ah, Hi, yeah, welcome. Yeah, thank you, yeah. So uh, about my yes. the, idea of so, this session, yeah, the idea of this session is to get parents an overview of uh, when they should think their child has asthma because wheezing in children is quite common here and uh, viral wheezing or uh, transitional wheezing in the first two, three years worries the parents as to think whether they have asthma. And So can you give us an overview of what asthma is when you think treatment is essential and how they should adhere to the treatment? Yeah, so I mean... So the problem with asthma in the diagnosis is that there's no one test that can, we can do, bingo, we have the diagnosis. So the key symptoms we expect to see are children suffering from, yes, cough is a common symptom, but it's not the only symptom. And we should be seeing some issue with their breathing, such as difficulty in breathing, the, pair, uh, the child, if it's old enough, as you're saying, it's tight, it's hard to breathe, and we may hear some wheeze. Now, you mentioned wheeze being a common issue, but the way parents interpret different noises that children have with their breathing, it's often the case that what they think is wheeze is in fact not wheeze. And now, as a doctor, if you hear wheeze, in your clinic, then you know the child has a history of wheezing, but often you're relying on the parent's story. Of course, wheezing is a high-pitched whistling noise on breathing out. And often I imitate it in the clinic when I explain to parents what wheezing is when they say their child's wheezing, I sort of go, <laughs> it's very high, it's that whistling sound. And actually when you do that, often parents then say, oh no, it's not that. They describe maybe a crackly noise or something else which is not wheezing and is therefore maybe not asthma and maybe more infection related. So certainly the story is key in asthma and obviously hearing about triggers of what's causing those symptoms such as exercise or allergy is also an issue. So, um, but coughing on its own, I would say, is almost never asthma. And of course, one common problem with coughing um, is the fact that children cough a lot um, and they get lots of viruses here. But in a child that's coughing all the time, what I tend to ask is, do they cough at night? If the child doesn't cough at night, then and they're asleep, because they're asleep, then that's not asthma, and that could be a habit cough. So certainly getting the, the story is key, much like in any allergy history, such as food allergy or anaphylaxis, that story is key. So um, now other clues, if there's family history of allergy, if the child has allergy problems such as eczema or food allergy or hay fever, then that increases the risk of asthma and maybe their symptoms are caused by asthma. If the child has had treatment, as I said, it can be hard. So we sometimes do start treatment in children we're not entirely sure about. But if that treatment shows no response in reducing their symptoms, such as inhaled steroids, if that doesn't help, then that may be a clue that this isn't asthma. Or if they give Ventolin and they find relief and they report a response, then that's a clue. So history is important. And as a doctor seeing a patient with asthma, or as a parent not sure what's going on, then looking for those clues in both sides is important in any consultation about asthma before you even make that diagnosis. So, um, so you, I guess you know you've come, you've, you feel you're happy that this is asthma, but the child has poor control. What does poor control mean? So that we define poor control as needing your Ventolin inhaler or feeling tight in the chest more than two times a week and also poor control if there's any limitation in their activities at school or affecting their sleep. 
So I think one of the issues with asthma is really parents don't appreciate perhaps how potentially serious it is. And when you speak to them and they say, oh, well, my child, yeah, he doesn't do much sports, but he's got asthma. Or yeah, he coughs a lot, but he's got asthma. Well, actually, that means there's a problem and we don't just leave it. I say it's asthma and that needs uh, addressing because we expect children with asthma to lead normal lives, have normal exercise tolerance and not need their inhalers more than two times a week and if they are needing it more than two times a week then there's a problem and we need to address it so the first thing is to assess their control and we should be asking that every time a child comes with an asthma attack or comes for a consultation one of the key things we need to think about when a child has an asthma attack as doctors is yes we treat the attack we give them ventolin the wheezing is better they go home we give them steroids etc but we also should be thinking, why have they had an attack? What's going on? What was their control like before the attack? What can we do to prevent this attack? Children die from asthma, and I tell parents this when they worry about using the medication, but the risk of dying from asthma is increased if you're having lots of attacks or you're needing lots of Ventolin many times, and we need to therefore be addressing why rather than just addressing the attack. So we think, so a child perhaps has poor control. We are happy that it's asthma from the history. Um, what, do, what, you know, what do we need to be thinking about? So if they're already on treatment, there is an asthma uh, guideline. Uh, there's several guidelines in, in the world. Obviously one for here we talk about is the GINA guideline. And that talks about stepping up your treatment. But really before we talk about treatment, we need to be addressing any issues around their current management. So first of all, if they're on an inhaled steroid already, are they taking it? Are we sure they are taking it? If we prescribe their medicines, how often are they requesting steroid inhalers? A steroid inhaler should be lasting one month, one to two months tops. So if they've not had many prescriptions, we know they're not taking it. So are they taking it? And if they're not, then ask them why. And it's vital that parents feel reassured that if their child needs, needs inhaled steroids, then they need to take it every day, twice a day, um, to reduce the inflammation. The problem with the steroid is that when, parent, when children and adults take it, they don't feel any relief from that steroid. They think this isn't doing anything for me. But they don't feel instant relief. What it does is reduce the risk of them having an attack where they then need their blue inhaler where, for which they do get relief. But wrongly, they feel this blue inhaler is working and the steroid is not. So they may not take their steroid inhaler, but then they will need to keep on using their blue inhaler because they're not having any anti-inflammatory medicine to reduce that reliance on the blue inhaler. So that's vital. So certainly they, we need to be asking if they're taking their medicine. Parents worry about steroids. Um, but if used appropriately and safely, and then they're safe, much like in eczema, inhaled steroids, they're not like all steroids, they're very focused on the, on the chest, in the lungs. And some, some research suggests long-term use may lead to a slight reduction in height after many years. But, you know, if they, but what can also affect your growth is having poorly controlled asthma being a little bit short, you can't die from that, you can die from asthma. So it depends on the case, but inhaled steroids when they're needed, and we've checked that they need it because of the history, et cetera, then they are important and we should be reassuring parents. So are they taking their medicine? And then if we think they are taking it, or the parents may say, oh no, no, I'm sure my little, my boy is taking it. Having said that, when they say that, it's important to ask, well, are you supervising? your child. Now, as well as adherence, it's vital to know that their child adult is, is taking the inhalers properly. Of course, if you are prescribed an inhaler and you're not taking it properly, it won't work. And I think it's our duty as doctors, if we're going to prescribe these medicines, we need to be making sure the parents know how to give it, how the child takes it. And there are lots of videos online. But if we think about the PMDI, the metered dose inhaler. This is one here. This is the blue one. This is Ventolin. Now, often children, I believe, certainly older children, are taking it in their mouth. 
but let's think about how what it's like when it comes out. So like if I if I press one now, that comes out extremely fast. And what we're, what we want that medicine to do if they're taking it in their mouth is to go round the bend here, down the trachea, all the way into the lungs. And it's coming out that quickly. Impossible. So we must use a spacer. Okay, if you're going to prescribe this. Now, if you're giving the blue one that in the mouth, they're taking lots of puffs, they're going to get some medicine. But if you're taking your steroid inhaler this way, just one or two puffs morning and evening, and that's it, then we need to optimize that delivery to make sure they get as much as they can. So if a child is using, is taking their steroid inhaler, but their control is poor, but they're taking it in the mouth, then we need to give them a spacer. And this is, so this is like a spacer. And what this does is when we have it inside the spacer, it's in the mouth, they're taking breaths. So take five puffs. So that way, as you can see, we've got this in between the mouth and the, and the, the inhaler and we're not relying to catch it and it's staying aerosolized and then they can just take normal breaths and they will get much more of their medication. Now, if children are refusing to use a space, so older children, it doesn't look very uh, trendy. There aren't many photos on Facebook with children saying, look at me with my spacer, I look really cool. Then there are alternatives such as dry powder inhalers. And these are activated um, whereby you're in control because you're breathing in. So, but again, if you're going to prescribe something like this, and this is Simbacort, you need to know how to give it. I advise you to, as a doctor or as a parent, if you're not sure, go on YouTube, look for videos, how to take spaces. There's a very good website, www.asthma.org.uk, which has videos on there regarding all the inhalers. So first, so are you taking your inhaler? Are you taking it correctly? The third thing we need to think about are, is allergic triggers. Why is this child having asthma exacerbations? Yes, viruses are a common cause and commonly virus attack, asthma attacks spike in September, October when children go back to school. But children get asthma attacks all year round. Ask about allergy triggers. What, what's happening at home? Do they have any pets? Do they have seasonal asthma? Do they have itchy nose, itchy eyes, runny nose? Are they doing that a lot? Hay fever and asthma are closely linked. And if they do have hay fever and asthma, then if we treat the hay fever, the asthma will get better because what's triggering the nose will also trigger the lungs. It's all one airway. So I would advise you, if you have a child with asthma that's struggling, to do some allergy tests. And you can do a blood test, looking for triggers in the air, testing pets, pollens, and dust mite. And if they have dust mite allergy based on a blood test, then again, there are things you can do to reduce exposure, uh, such as dust mite covers for the pillow and the mattress and the quilt, as well as um, proper cleaning, etc. That's another talk. But again, it's all available online. But first, we need to be looking for it. So I do do uh, panel testing for aeroallergens. Don't do any food allergy testing. It won't be food allergy unless there's a clear history when they eat a food, they have an allergic reaction. But so really you're looking at all those things before you're going up on their treatment. If you have a child with difficult asthma, if you're not sure of the diagnosis, then there are some tests we can do for asthma. So you can do a lung function test where we get them to blow into a machine looking for their loop. And we're looking to see if it's abnormal, if there's evidence of any um, restrictive uh, airway disease which if we then give Ventolin, we see them improve and that is diagnostic of asthma, fairly good diagnostic. We could do allergy tests. If they are allergic to things in the air, that's a big clue that they may have asthma if they have symptoms that you're not sure about, particularly in the younger age group, in the under fives, um, where diagnosing asthma is more difficult, but if there's history of allergy, eczema, and we do some testing, 
that may suggest they may warrant uh, trying on some inhaled corticosteroids. So do think about tests for asthma and do think about the basics of treatment, compliance, allergy, technique. All those things are vital at every time you see someone. And really, whenever a child presents with an asthma attack, okay, treat the asthma attack, but think about what's going on around that child. Are they taking their medicine? Are they taking it regularly? What can we do to prevent another attack? Which is hard, but always be thinking about that in your mind. Thank you. It was very helpful. And in terms of uh, steroids, you mentioned inhaled steroids and their safety and uh, families where children have had asthma attacks, they have the oral prednisolone like Predo with them. So would you encourage parents to start it early if they think the child does have an acute attack before they even see the doctor? Or um, So it, all steroids do have an important part to play for uh, managing the acute asthma attack. But um, I think it's hard for parents to know really how bad an attack is. And if they're worried and they're having an attack, best to get checked out. When we look at the data in the UK, we got over a year about of, of, of why children and adults died from asthma. They looked at data over a year, which I was a little bit involved in the study when we looked at notes of different children and adults. When we think about where do children and adults die, half of the adults that died in the group died at home. 80% of children it's a small number, but they died at home. That tells me that parents don't know how severe the asthma is. They don't understand. Maybe this is more severe than they think. They're not sure what treatment to give, etc. Another thing we can do to improve asthma control in children is to give them an asthma plan. So, but it, I, you know, I worry what's happening at home, and uh, therefore giving them steroids in somebody who's very known is very aware of their asthma. Then maybe. But really, I think it's best to get checked out. And then, of course, when you use your steroids, the question is, how long do you need to take it for? When we send children home, having had an asthma attack, and we give them a weaning plan for their Ventolin, reduce this over the next few days, take steroids for two days, there's no evidence or really much science behind that. Yes, we know that people will improve, but we don't know how quickly. So it's important to sit, review children really after a couple of days to check that they are better, to check that, that they can reduce their Ventolin and to check that we can now maybe stop the steroids, all steroids. And also it's an opportunity maybe if we've not had time to, to go through their history in the a &E or somewhere to look at what's been going on prior to this attack. But that review is important. And we know that the people, people who die from asthma, there is a 30% of those that died from asthma died within 28 days of an attack. So it's a risk factor. I think uh, many parents would be thinking about uh, fear of death, but uh, recently we had a discussion with uh, Dr. Panikar in his KMC who said it's very unusual to get an asthma death in UAE and the severity seems a little less here than compared to UK, but the parents should still take it as seriously as they would anywhere because of the lack of predictability. And in terms of uh, wheezing in early infancy, I mean, bronchiolitis, viral wheeze, where do you draw the line from asthma and would you use inhaled steroids or even Monte Lucas agents in these cases? Yeah, so um, again, I think, uh, so the problem is with asthma treatment is the first line is inhaled steroids and that's now, but it's not one site, not all asthma is the same. And research is telling us more about perhaps we can, which types of asthma may be going on and which children are more likely to respond to inhaled steroids than not. The children under five are a difficult group because um, it's common, they commonly get viruses as they're building their immunity. It's common for children to get wheezing with viruses. It doesn't mean they have asthma. However, we know that children, if they wheeze a lot and have many attacks from a young age group, it can lead to long-term reduction in their lung function. So we need to be trying to identify those who may respond to inhaled corticosteroids and use them. And the ones that are more likely to are those who've got some allergy history, be it they have some positive IgE to dust or to pets or to pollens, etc. So in those children who have recurrent attacks, you could try inhaled corticosteroids, but then they should be seeing some improvements. So do review them, don't leave them on it for years. 
and do some testing, do a blood count looking for higher cinephils and IgE test. And if they are positive in either of those two, then they're more likely to respond to inhaled corticosteroids. I know it was a bit long, but very important topic. And uh, we already had Sorry, a discussion. How long was it? Uh, no, it's fine. <laughs> we had a discussion with Basil earlier about nebulizer versus inhaler, and we are trying to encourage people to use the inhaler more. And your demonstration really helps people understand it better. So I appreciate your uh, time, and uh, thank you so much, uh, David, for uh, giving us this insight. Thank you, Dr. See you soon. Take care. And in terms of uh, parents, I mean, I'm sure they'll have questions. If you have any questions for Dr. David, please put in the comment section. We will get back to you. Uh, yeah, no problem. Thank you for being on this video. Thank you.